Now, let me introduce John Stott. He's, on, he's put great pressure on me to make this short. And uh, I also hate long introductions, but you know, he deserves them and I don't. So, I would, I would, of course he's well known, of course you've all heard of him and read his books, but I want to give you some personal context that would actually help you understand Redeemer. In fact, the kind of Christianity that we are trying to uh, live out in New York City. Personal context, Tim and Kathy Keller, without John Stott, Tim and Kathy Keller's Christianity would not be recognizable to you. There's always a possibility it wouldn't even be there. Because in the middle of the 20th century, when Christianity was absolutely divided between what you have to call fundamentalism and liberalism, John Stott was the leader of a small group of people, almost completely, by the way, British, who carved out a new space and whatever you want, whatever the word means to you now, or what it means now in America, put that aside for a second. Is these folks carved out a space in the 40s and the 50s called evangelicalism. And it was a space between the separatism, the legalism, the sectarianism of fundamentalism, and the vacuity of, uh, of liberalism. And it was orthodox and biblical, and yet it was academically and culturally engaged, not separatist, was an anti-intellectual. It was, it was oriented both to social action and justice as well as to evangelism. It was uh, interdenominational. It wasn't sectarian. It was willing to work across the traditions. It was, a, it was a new thing. And an awful lot of us in America who became Christians uh, through campus ministries in the 50s and 60s and 70s, if it wasn't for John Stott's books and some C.S. Lewis books, there wouldn't have been anything to read that would have put us into that space. We would have either been stuck in the, in the sectarian legalism of the one side or the, the liberalism of the other side. I don't know, I'm really not sure how, uh, if you talk to almost anybody my age who became a Christian in the 60s, if it wasn't for John Stott books and, you know, and his associates, I'm not sure, we, we would have been completely different kinds of Christians than we are now. Secondly, when we came, to, when Kathy and I came to New York City to start Redeemer almost 17, 18 years ago, we did not look to influential American churches to come up with an idea of what to do here. Because we knew that New York was not much like the suburbs of Atlanta or Chicago or even Southern California. But New York was a lot like London. And when I looked at London, I saw that John Stott, though it was quite a number of years ago now, invented a kind of center city ministry which we have carried on at, New York, at Redeemer. Bible exposition, strong biblical preaching is the way to do evangelism. And yet again, a mixture of word and deed, evangelism and social justice, and uh, a mixture of integrating your faith with your work, not just simply developing church leaders but cultural leaders. All of that stuff that you consider rather unusual and balanced and unique about Redeemer, John Stott actually uh, pioneered at All Souls. And there are a number of other center city churches in London that have the same kind of balance. We are much more like that, the model that John Stott pioneered years ago. Now, I don't, I'm just, so that's just some personal context. We wouldn't, Redeemer wouldn't be here if it wasn't for John Stott. I owe him a debt. We, we owe him a debt. You, we can't repay. Now, of course, he's been a world leader for many years. And in, uh, you know, in, uh, in conclusion, let me just say this. There's a place in The Lord of the Rings <laughs> where someone describes Gandalf and says he's not just a lore master, you know, a wise teacher, but also a mover of the great deeds of our time. And that's John Stott, Gandalf without the bad temper. <laughs> uh, John Stott, fortunately, since we've been talking about prayer all year as leaders, John Stott has been willing to come and give us a presentation on prayer to fit in with the, with the emphasis. We're going to have, a, by the way, a prayer retreat at Redeemer, June 2nd and 3rd, to culminate this entire year of emphasis on prayer amongst our leaders. And John Stott, instead of coming in and doing whatever he wants to do, he has been willing to uh, be part of this. And so we are now going to hear from uh, Dr. John Stott, and he's going to give us an exposition and a study on the subject of prayer. Well, hi, everybody. I would, I beg your pardon? Should I be closer to the mic? A little bit. 
I thought, be careful not to kick the platform down. You're fine. <laughs> so I would like first to thank uh, Tim Keller for his extremely kind, uh, interesting, historical uh, introduction. <laughs> and I would like to add what a joy and a privilege it is to be worshipping with you in Redeemer Church uh, tonight. Thank you so much for your welcome. Well, as Tim has told you, my topic, the topic given to me is prayer. And if, as I imagine, you have your Bible, I would like to, you immediately to turn to my text. It's the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse 18. I hope by the end of this evening we will have learned this text by heart. Here it is, especially for those who haven't got their Bibles with them. Ephesians 2, 18. For through him, that's Jesus Christ, through him we have access by one spirit unto the Father. And the essence of those words is in the three words in the middle of the sentence, we have access. Access is a fairly common word in our vocabulary today. We talk about gaining access to a particular person we want to see, or of gaining access to a place that is often locked up and not available, or we talk about access to a website. And recently in the United Kingdom, a public debate has blown up as to whether the courts should grant divorced people, a divorced couple, uh, equal access to their children. So we use the word access in a good many different senses. Tonight, however, we are thinking about access to God. It would, I think, be very hard to find a better definition of prayer than those three words. We have access. Not we hope to gain access one day, but that we have it already as a present, continuous privilege as the people of God. Well, the Greek word that is translated access was used of uh, approaching a person of rank, especially a monarch. And the word presupposes the magnificence and pageantry of the courts, the royal courts of the ancient Near East in which the sovereign was elevated on his throne and an elaborate protocol was observed before an audience could be granted uh, to the sovereign. And in this access to God, we are able to say that neither protocol nor ceremonial is necessary. There is no need even to request an audience or make an appointment with the King of Kings. No access is granted to the people of God immediately because God's throne is a throne of grace and all those who approach it are welcome. Well, that's a bit of an introduction, but let's come back to our text. And the first point I want to make is access to God in prayer is through Jesus Christ. You notice my text which says, through him we have access by one spirit unto the Father. The paradoxical background to this uh, promise of access to God is his inaccessibility which is much emphasized in the Old Testament. For example, when God met Moses at the burning bush, he said to him, don't come any nearer. Take off your shoes from your feet, the place on which you're standing is holy ground, and Moses, we read, hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And a little later, when the people assembled, at the foot of Mount Sinai, God directed Moses, tell the people not to come here or to come near. 
and the curtain or veil which hung before the Holy of Holies in the temple and before that in the tabernacle was a permanent symbol of the inaccessibility of God on pain of death. Have you ever considered that extraordinary, uh, that uh, extraordinary paradox? How can we resolve the paradox? How is it possible for us to gain access to the inaccessible? Well, there is only one way, and that is through him we have access by one spirit unto the Father. Through him, that is through Jesus Christ. And this is the climax of the second chapter of Ephesians, in which Paul explains that Christ died to break down the barriers between Jews and Gentiles and to reconcile us to God and to each other. So friends, are we all clear about this? Namely, that apart from the cross on which Jesus died for our sins, apart from the cross, there will be no possibility of access or approach to God. And if we are tempted to draw near to the holiness and glory of God in the tattered rags of our own morality and our own so-called self-righteousness, we would shrivel up and be consumed. But our God is a consuming fire. Now I want to call this first point the humility of prayer. We can only come to God if we humble ourselves and recognize that we may not presume to come to his throne trusting in our own righteousness, but only in his manifold and great mercies, which you may recognize as a quotation from the Episcopal prayer book. So we have no right to come in our own morality, and the only ground on which we dare to approach God in his otherwise inaccessibility is to come to him through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the one who died in order that we might come to him. So in the prayer book, uh, or the Episcopal prayer book, there are a number of prayers, most of them end. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Or sometimes more elaborately, we humbly beg this through the merits and mediation of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We have to come humbly. There is no possibility of prayer that does not begin with humility. Like Abraham, we say, Behold, I have taken upon me to come unto the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes and have no merit to come. Or like Ezra, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my head to you, O Lord. As Christian people, instead of that, we're able with boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, only because he died in our place, bearing our sin and dying our death. So that's the first point which I think my text makes plain. Access to God in prayer is through Jesus Christ and there is no other way. And we need to remind ourselves of that as we come to pray. Now secondly, access to God in prayer is through the Son and to the Father. Of course, adherents of all religions attempt to engage in some form of prayer, but only Christians believe that they are permitted to call God their Father and to use the very word that Jesus himself used when he came to pray. Father was the word he used. Some of you will know the name, I think, of a late professor, Jeremias, a German professor, and I want to quote something from him in his book, The Central Message of the New Testament. He says, to date, nobody has produced one single instance in Palestinian Judaism 
where God is addressed as my father by an individual person. But Jesus did it constantly. More reasonable, more, excuse me, more remarkable still is the fact that he used the diminutive word, Aramaic word Abba, my father. Nowhere in the literature of the prayers of ancient Judaism an immense treasure too little explored is this invocation of God as Abba to be found. But Jesus, on the other hand, always used it whenever he prayed, with one exception, when he prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then Jeremias goes on, to a Jewish mind, it would have been irreverent and therefore unthinkable to call God this by this familiar word. It was something new, something unique and unheard of that Jesus dared to take this step and speak with God as his father, as a child coming to his father, simply, intimately, securely. Abba, as an address to God, is the ipsissima vox, that is the, the very voice of God, an authentic and original utterance of Jesus. And now, friends, the wonderful thing is that God allows us to use this very word that Jesus used in his approach to the Father. We, too, may call him Abba, my Father. Which brings me to think with you for a moment or two about Muslims, if I may. You know Muslims have 99 names for God. They call them excellent attributes. Creator, sustainer, protector, provider, 99 of them. And many Muslims use them as a kind of rosary while they're saying their prayers. 33, and then 66, and then 99 and not one of them is Father. Some Muslims add jokingly that there is only one creature which knows the hundredth name of God, and that is the camel, which explains the look of ineffable superiority on the camel's face. But Christians do know the hundredth name, and the hundredth name of God is father. So we are to approach him as a child approaches a father, and this I want to call the simplicity of prayer. For well, nothing could be simpler than coming to our heavenly father in prayer. Now, of course, there are some fathers who are stern and abusive and cruel, but the true father is not, and that is the kind of father that we are thinking about. Sorry, I've just lost my place for a moment. I asked Tim to tell you that I was 85 years old. <laughs> because that is a fact which evidently Tim didn't wish to acknowledge. So I'm continuing to talk until I find my place. It's here somewhere, here it is. You all know the name of Hudson Taylor, the founder of what used to be called the China Inland Mission and is now called the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. Hudson Taylor loved to think of God as his heavenly father, and I have a quotation from him that I would like to share with you. I am taking my children with me on his way to China, he said, and I notice that it is not difficult for me to remember that the little ones need breakfast in the morning, dinner at midday, and something before they go to bed at night. Indeed, I could not forget it. And I find it impossible to suppose that our Heavenly Father is less tender or mindful than I. And again, I do not believe that our Heavenly Father will ever forget his children. I am a very poor father, he went on, but it is not my habit to forget my children. 
God is a very, very good father, and it is not his habit to forget his children. So that's the third point. Now the fourth. Or it may be the third, I forget how many. My maths are not very good. Here we are. Access to God in prayer is not only through the Son and to the Father, but by the Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is just as necessary to our prayers as is the ministry of Christ, but their ministries are different. It's through the mediation of the Son that we come to the Father, and it's by the inspiration of the Spirit that we come to the Father. So, in, again, if I may quote from the Episcopal Prayer Book, at the beginning of our communion service, we have this lovely prayer. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open and all desires known, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may truly love you and glorify your holy name. You see, it is the Holy Spirit who witnesses with our spirit that we are the children of God. It's the Holy Spirit who assures us that God is our Father and that he pours his love into our hearts. For without these assurances of God's fatherly love towards us, we could not enjoy access to him. Now this third aspect of prayer I'm going to call the intimacy of prayer, which the Holy Spirit makes possible. He takes our wayward, undisciplined minds and focuses them on our Father. And when we are forgetful or lethargic or sluggish, he helps our infirmities and enables us to concentrate. He takes us by the hand and he leads us into the Father's presence. Access to God in prayer is by the Holy Spirit, through the Son, by the Spirit. And now fourthly, access to God in prayer is with all God's people. Did you notice in verse 18 that through him we both, that's Jews and Gentiles, have access by one Spirit unto the Father. The context is the reconciling death of Jesus. And as a result of his reconciling, atoning death, both Jews and Gentiles, representative of all the nations, have equal access to God, to the one and only Father, through the one and only Son, by the one and only Spirit, all of us, can have access, and this speaks of the community of prayer. Now, of course, there is a place, a private prayer. Jesus himself told us in the Sermon on the Mount that when we pray, we are to enter our room and pray to our Father in secret. But he also told us when we pray in secret to say, Our Father, which is plural, of course, because we are members of the worldwide family of God. So whenever we pray, even when we're by ourselves in the secret place, let's not imagine that we can monopolize God. Let's not be so preoccupied with ourselves and our own needs that we forget the rest of the family and their needs. Instead, let's deliberately remember that we belong to the most multinational, multicultural society in the world. These others have access to God just as we do. And as we gather around his throne, or when we gather around his table, we know that we do it together. Thus, to begin to conclude, thus prayer is an essentially Trinitarian experience. It constantly reminds us that we are Trinitarian Christians since we have access to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit, and that with all the people of God. So let me recapitulate and conclude for just another moment or two. 
we've considered one that access is to the Son. This speaks of the simplicity of prayer as we come with the simplicity of a little child. Two, access is through the Son. This speaks of the humility of prayer as we come only through the Savior who died for us. Thirdly, access is by the Spirit, and this speaks of the intimacy of prayer as the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. And fourthly, access is with all the people of God. We both, we all have access. And this speaks of the community of prayer as we come to God together, remembering that we are members of the worldwide body of Christ. So I conclude, let's try to remember these things as we come to God in prayer. You know, friends, if we do remember these things, I think that they will bring new dimensions into our prayer life, a new richness, a new French freshness, a breadth and a depth that we did not have before in our praying. Let's learn Ephesians 2 verse 18 by heart and say it over and over to ourselves when we begin to pray. And above all, let's never take prayer for granted, but rejoice in the privilege that God has given us, that we have access. We have access to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit, with all the people of God. Amen.